Hey there everybody, I'm Joe the Disney Guy and welcome to another edition of Disney Guy Reviews. Today we'll be looking at Disney's shortest yet most heartwarming feature, Dumbo. The euphoria surrounding the Disney Studios was starting to wear off by the early 1940s. Despite the runaway success of Snow White, the follow-up efforts of both Pinocchio and Fantasia were both major financial failures. With 45% of Disney's revenue also being cut off due to World War II raging in Europe, the company was beginning to enter dire financial straits, and morale was beginning to slip. In late 1939, Disney's head of merchandise licensing, Kay Kamen, brought to Walt the prototype of a new storytelling device called a Rollerbook. This prototype in particular featured a story written on it by Helen Averson about an elephant with oversized ears called Dumbo. Walton immediately took a shine to the story and purchased the rights. Time it took to obtain the rights to Mary Poppins? 20 years. Time it took to obtain the rights to Dumbo? 20 minutes. Guess Helen Averson didn't write Dumbo about her hard childhood in Australia. Originally, Dumbo was intended to be a short, but Walt began to realize that the only way to do the story justice was to make it a feature. Despite his initial enthusiasm, however, Walt began to cool on the project, likely due to being so busy with the production of Bambi, and ordered all pre-work on Dumbo to stop. Script developers Dick Humor and Joe Grant decided to rekindle Walt's interest in the project in a unique way. They presented Walt with their script written like chapters from a book, sending Walt a new chapter every few days, complete with details, drawings, and cliffhangers. Clearly, they knew that Walt's one weakness was his childlike whimsy for stories. Humor and Grant's outside-the-box strategy was successful, and in January of 1940, storyboards for Dumbo as the studio's fourth animated feature began. With the financial losses of both Pinocchio and Fantasia still looming over his head, Walt's mandate to director Ben Sharp's theme was simple, keep things cheap. With this in mind, simplicity became the theme for Dumbo's art style. Watercolors, like the ones used in Silly Symphonies, were used for backgrounds as opposed to the oil paints used in previous features, and there are far less intricate details and shots used throughout. In fact, Disney's famous multiplane camera was barely used at all in Dumbo. Special effects were also severely limited in an effort to keep funds down. The music in the film was also simplified, with Frank Churchill and Oliver Wallace's score and Ed Washington's songs commenting on the plot rather than advancing it like in past features. Even the story development process was streamlined, with less editing and deleted scenes save money and time. In fact, the only major change to Abraham's story was that Dumbo's main friend was altered from a robin to a mouse to play in the old adage of who elephants fear. On the bright side, these cost-cutting measures did work. Dumbo only cost the studio $800,000 to make, which still makes it the cheapest feature ever released by the Disney Studios. On the downside, of course, we didn't get to see what nightmare-inducing terrors Walt could have come up with if he used special effects on the Pink Elephants on Parade sequence. So, you win some, you lose some. With all the simplicity to the style, more time was able to be spent on character development and acting. Animators visited zoos and even brought animals into the studio to study them. African-American tap dancers, the Jackson Brothers, were also brought in and filmed doing dances while lip-syncing When I See an Elephant Fly in order to animate the intricate choreography of the crows. But the real achievement in Dumbo was accomplished by animator Vladimir Taitla, who was in charge of giving a personality to a wordless protagonist. Taitla drew inspiration from his two-year-old son and animated Dumbo to behave more like a young child than a young elephant. Taitla also gave Dumbo very expressive eyes and deliberate motions in order to convey his emotions to the audience without speaking. Despite the main character's lack of dialogue, Dumbo still contained plenty of talented voice actors, including Edward Brophy as Timothy Q. Mouse, the voice of Jiminy Cricket Cliff Edwards as the head crow, and future Disney mainstay Sterling Holloway and Verna Felton as the stork and matriarch elephant respectively. The coolest voice in the movie, however, was done by Margaret Wright, who voiced Casey Jr., the train. She used a device called a Sonavox, which is basically a prehistoric vocoder. Just look at this thing in action. All aboard! All aboard! Clear the track! Here I go! I mean, come on, you gotta admit, that thing is pretty cool. Unfortunately, shortly after primary animation was finished, turmoil struck the Disney Studios. In late May of 1941, led by Art Babbitt, many of the animators, including Vladimir Taitla, went on strike against Walt, crippling the studio. Though the strike only lasted for about five weeks, irreparable damage was done to the family atmosphere at the studio, and many of the strikers were caricatured in the film as the grotesque clowns who were hitting up the big boss for a raise. I bet that was an awkward conversation when they came back and found out that they were being portrayed as clowns. Despite the distractions, though, Dumbo still managed to have a short development, under two years, and on October 23, 1941, Dumbo was premiered at the Broadway Theater in New York City. Dumbo the Great! So Dumbo didn't have as many bells and whistles as the other animated features, but is it just as good? 
Well, it can be hard to compare Dumbo to some of the other classic Disney features, because the animation style just lacks a lot of the intricate details that the others do. Really, the brighter and simpler style is more comparable to a silly symphony than a feature. That being said, I think the simpler animation works for Dumbo. It keeps things colorful, adds to the circus-like atmosphere, and really forces you to focus on the character animation of Dumbo, which really is fantastic. You can just watch Dumbo's eyes throughout and know exactly what he is feeling. There's a number of sequences in the film that are really interesting to look at as well, including one of the trippiest sequences in Disney history, Pink Elephants on Parade. By the way, between Dumbo, Timothy, Bacchus, and Pinocchio, we've had now four Disney characters who have been drunk over the last three movies. Do we need to start like Disney AA or something? I was surprised to see how mean they made a lot of the characters. I mean, right from the start, they mercilessly pick on Dumbo, though in a lot of ways, this excessive cruelty does make Dumbo's triumph all the more satisfying, and it makes you appreciate much more when someone actually is nice to him. Overall, I- <coughs> Racist alert! Racist alert! Racist alert! Yeah, 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 I saw that coming. Pardon the pun, but I think it's time we address the elephant in the room. The crows. The crows have come under some heavy scrutiny as being racist stereotypes of African Americans. And yeah, some of the criticism is indeed warranted. I mean, the leader of the Crows is officially named Jim Crow for crying out loud. For those of you unfamiliar with American history, Jim Crow laws basically allowed for legal segregation in the United States from 1876 to 1965. So yeah, not exactly the best thing to be making light of. Though to be fair, aside from Cliff Edwards, the Crows were voiced by African Americans, the Hal Johnson Choir, and much of their dialogue was based off the ribbing that they did on each other during their concerts. Also, the Crows are some of the only characters who are actually sympathetic to Dumbo and try to help him out. All in all, yeah, you probably can consider the Crows to be racially insensitive, but they're portrayed as such positive and important characters in the film that it's hard for me to go so far as to call them racist exactly, but hey, that's just my opinion. So now that all that awkwardness is out of the way, let's continue. Overall, I enjoyed Dumbo. It packs a lot of story in a short amount of time, only 64 minutes, and it's as emotion packed as any Disney feature before or since. It may be tough to compare it to movies like Pinocchio or Cinderella, but there's no denying that Dumbo is definitely a classic in its own right. RKO Pictures and Disney butted heads again with the release of Dumbo. RKO wanted Disney to either cut the length of Dumbo down to the length of a short, extend it to at least 70 minutes, or release it as a B-movie in conjunction with another feature. Walt declined all three options and pushed Dumbo through as an A-feature anyway, because, you know, he's Walt Disney. Luckily for Disney, Dumbo was a smash hit, receiving high critical praise, but more importantly, drawing moviegoers. Dumbo made $1.6 million in his initial release, making it Disney's most financially successful feature of the 1940s, and bringing in some desperately needed cash flow. The movie was so successful that Time Magazine planned to put Dumbo on the cover of their December 1941 issue, naming him their Mammal of the Year. Unfortunately, a little incident called Pearl Harbor happened on December 7th and it derailed that idea. A national tragedy does tend to take precedent over an animated elephant after all. Dumbo, as was becoming standard for Disney features, racked up the accolades and awards, receiving an Academy Award nomination in 1941 for Best Original Song for Baby Mine, winning an Academy Award for Best Original Score, winning Best Animation Design at the 1947 Cannes Film Festival, and even being honored in 2011 as one of Time's 25 Best Animated Features of All Time. Dumbo was re-released four times in 1949, 1959, 1972, and 1976, and was the first Disney feature to be aired in its entirety on television in 1975 as part of Disney's wonderful world of color. Dumbo's legacy can also be seen in many Disney works, with the Pink Elephants on Parade sequence influencing future surrealist scenes in Disney features, and with Disney's 2002 film Lilo and Stitch drawing heavily from Dumbo's art style. And Dumbo can still be seen flying every day by millions of people around the world in the highly popular Dumbo the Flying Elephant ride at the Disney parks. So although Dumbo may have been Disney's cheapest film ever to make, it still ended up being one of its most memorable. Well guys, that about wraps it up for me this week. I hope you all enjoyed, and make sure you subscribe to my channel, check out my Facebook and Twitter in the links down below, and check out last week's video and next week's video. And I'll see you all next week.